In this video, we'll be looking at the key principles behind designing PowerPoint slides for a scientific presentation. Now here are the key principles uh, in designing PowerPoint slides. First, you need to create a slide as a single message unit. In other words, each slide should have a main point, a takeaway so that viewers know exactly how to read the slide. Next, you should explicitly state that message on the slide. And you can do that in the headline, but it can be done elsewhere on the slide. Next, avoid bullet points. Opt instead for word tables. You really should work to limit your bullet points. Bullet points are meant for lists, not concepts or ideas. That's where word tables work best. Use simple diagrams when you can, especially when you introduce a scientific concept. And a simple conceptual diagram can really set the stage for your talk. Make sure you signal the steps in biological processes without any signaling items like arrows, numbers, and letters. No one will understand the flow of the process. Annotate key biological structures. Even if you think your audience knows the biological structure well, annotate anyway. When you annotate those key components, they will focus on the things you want them to focus on. Also annotate your data, tables and graphs. Show the viewer exactly how they should read that table and that graph. And then finally, use builds, especially for complex slides with multiple pieces of information. When you do builds, you will be able to control the methodical processing of information. If you present it all at once, the viewer will try to digest the content all at once. So let's take a look at some examples. First, create a slide as a single message unit. Let's take a look at this slide. What's happening here? Why are we looking at it? This slide is about apoptosis, but what's specifically about it? Are we defining it? Here the bullet point says, genetically programmed cell death of individual cells by fragmentation into membrane-bound particles. It, are we just defining it? Or in that second bullet point, are we focusing on a specific characteristic that apoptosis elicits no inflammatory response in adjacent cells and tissues? Or are we focusing on what causes it, in this case that it's induced by injury? or by what prevents it, that it's being suppressed by naturally occurring factors. As you can see, we are missing topic focus here. Now let's take a look at this revision. Can we see what the slide is about now? Yes, the slide headline here cues us into the subject matter. What is apoptosis and how does it happen? We label the definition and mention a characteristic that sets it apart from other biological processes, that it's death of individual cells by fragmentation into membrane-bound particles. And we note that apoptosis elicits no inflammatory response. And now we specifically state what drives the process and what can suppress it. It's typically genetically programmed, but it's also induced by injury. Note also that it can be suppressed by naturally occurring factors. Now we have a headline that cues us, clues us into the subject matter and we can see the entirety of the slide and what it's trying to accomplish. Next, when you have a main point takeaway, explicitly state that message on a slide. Take a look at this example, beta amyloid plaque formation. What are we looking at? Why are we looking at it? Here we just have a topic headline. It forces viewers to search for the main point. What am I looking at? Why am I looking at it? This revision, on the other hand, gives us a message headline. Viewers know what to take away. Sticky beta amyloid plaque aggregates after enzyme snipped A beta from APP molecule. So that message headline explicitly states what the slide is about and there's no ambiguity. There's no guessing on the part of the reader. 
next. Avoid bullet points. Opt instead for word tables. Let's look at our apoptosis slide again. We transform this into this. What makes this different? We've created a table with rows and columns and defined our categories within each row and within each column. And as you can see, it's much easier to read than a succession of bullet points. It also takes advantage of the horizontal flow of PowerPoint slides as opposed to the vertical, which is more applicable for standard paper presentations. Next, use simple diagrams when you can, especially when you introduce what will be complex ideas down the road. A simple conceptual diagram can set the stage. Here in this example, we have a message headline. Nanoparticles can be used in targeted drug delivery at the site of disease to improve the uptake of poorly soluble drugs. And now we have a very simple diagram that compares untargeted drug delivery with targeted drug delivery. Of course, actual process may be a lot more complex, but this provides a good general context to the overall subject matter of your presentation. Simple diagrams can be very powerful. Next, signal steps in a biological process. Because without any kind of signaling item, without numbers, arrows, and letters, viewers won't know how to read the steps or flow in a process. Here's a pretty good example. Microarray involves isolating RNA, making it fluorescent, hybridizing it to a microarray, and scanning under laser light. And as we can see, the flow is laid out for us left to right, top to bottom. Tissue, RNA, make your RNA copy tagged incorporating the fluorescence, hybridizing it to microarray, then scanning under laser light. But even this good diagram can be improved and integrated totally with the slide. Here's how. Microarray involves one, isolating RNA, two, making it fluorescent, three, hybridizing it to microarray, four, scanning under laser light. And notice how we combined both the enumeration of each process with the arrow flow. And the headline is connected explicitly with that process. Next, annotate key biological structures. Even if your audience knows what the structure is, annotating it will keep them focused. And here's another example. Tissue from the hippocampal region of the brain stained brown to display the tau protein. And then we annotate the two major structural components, the triangle shapes, which are neurofibrillary tangles, and the amyloid plaques, stained only for tau protein. So we immediately see what the most important structures are on this example. They are annotated. We know what we're looking at. There's no ambiguity. You should also annotate your data, tables and graphs. Show the viewer explicitly how to read the data and what to focus on. Let's look at how you might execute this using a figure example from a paper published in Cell Host and Microbe. Figures on the right here. The main point of this paper is that the bacteria Staphylococcus aureus, which needs iron, is more likely to thrive in the presence of human hemoglobin rather than other non-human forms of hemoglobin, such as mouse hemoglobin. And there's the source for our paper. So let's take a look. Here we show the slide. Human hemoglobin promotes S. aureus replication in iron limiting conditions. We have a message headline that tells us exactly how to read the slide. Then we provide figure captions. They're complete yet quite succinct. The top refers to the two graphs, which shows the growth of S. aureus Newman wild type in graph A and delta ISDB in graph B in liquid medium supplemented with hemoglobin as the sole iron source. 
the bottom caption shows the other set of experiments where the researchers took petri dishes containing iron restrictive agar, streaked them with bacterial cultures, and impregnated them with hemoglobin placed on top of the agar. And the Staphylococcus aureus growth was monitored. Then we have some key annotations. We point to the fact that on graph A, there are asterisks above our statistical bars. And they indicate that in those examples, there are statistically significant differences in the growth patterns. Then we have an annotation on the second set of experiments, which focuses on the gray areas, which represent the zones of growth of Staphylococcus aureus. Now, you should also use build, especially for complex slides, where a viewer will try to digest content all at once if you present it all at once. Instead, reveal content methodically. Again, let's use our example from cell host and microbe. Um, human hemoglobin promotes um, Staphylococcus aureus replication in iron limiting condition. We did two sets of experiments. Our first set of experiments looked at the growth of um, Staphylococcus aureus uh, Newman wild type in graph A and delta ISDB in graph B, both in liquid medium supplemented with hemoglobin as a sole iron source. And these graphs represent three independent experiments. Note here that the asterisk on our statistical bars represents statistically significant differences in the growth of uh, Staphylococcus aureus in human hemoglobin versus mouse hemoglobin. Our second set of experiments consisted of taking petri dishes with iron restrictive agar and streak those with bacterial cultures. The discs were then impregnated with hemoglobin placed on top of the agar and the Staphylococcus aureus growth was monitored. And these gray areas represent zones of growth and as you can see the zones of growth were larger in the human hemoglobin than they were in the mouse hemoglobin. Note how this build delivered the material in a methodical fashion. You controlled the presentation of the data and allowed the audience to focus on the key items in the data that were really important to you and helped convey the story of your science. So let's review our key principles. Create a slide as a single message unit, completely integrated. Explicitly state that message on the slide. Avoid bullet points, opt for word tables. Use simple diagrams when you can, especially to introduce key concepts. Signal your steps in biological processes with arrows, numbers, or letters, or combine them. Annotate your key biological structures so people know exactly what they're looking at. Annotate your data, tables, and graphs. Show people how to read the graph. And then finally, use builds to reveal your content methodically. When you follow these principles, your slides will serve your talk well and allow the story of your science to come through.